Good day. Oh, that's so nice. Was it extreme skiing today? I hope tomorrow is like this. I hope so. I think extreme skiing involves skiing places that are remote and isolated, as well as skiing something that's very steep. I'm not a technical climber. We've, I've, I've climbed a lot of places to ski. I've, I've accompanied a few expeditions in South America and so forth, and all with the purpose to, to ski down more than uh, technical climbing of any sort. One hundred and fifty kilometers north of Vancouver and forty kilometers from the coast, Mount Waddington is at thirteen thousand one hundred and seventy feet, the apex of British Columbia. Among climbers, it is known as a difficult and challenging climb. Mount Waddington in 1925 is an elusive peak. While both Mount Robson and Mount Logan, respectively the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies and the highest peak in Canada, have already been climbed, Mount Waddington is still at the center of an unexplored wilderness. To the world at large, the mountain does not exist, and it seems impossible that there could still be an unknown mountain of great height so close to the coast. Out of this emptiness, rumors of a massive peak emerge. When in 1925 this mystery mountain is actually discovered, explorers and climbers rush to find a route to its peak. Exploration prospers late in the coast range, mainly because access is more difficult. Coastal rainforests are thick and cannot be penetrated by pack horse. Valleys are steep and narrow. There are no maps and no roads. Early explorers endure great hardships. They relay many loads, and carry weeks of provisions. Grizzly bear, devil's club, and torrential glacier rivers present a constant threat. Bad and unpredictable weather further add to the difficulties. Mount Waddington is higher than the surrounding peaks and creates its own weather. With each failed attempt to climb the mountain, its reputation grows. For many years, the mountain is the center of a growing race to be the first to climb its summit. When in 1934, Mount Waddington claims its first life, the press hypes the peak as nightmare molded in rock, North America's Everest, and seemingly impossible to climb. Today, Mount Waddington sets a new challenge for a new breed of adventurers. The prize, a first ski descent. Joining the expedition are Peter Chinovsky, Alex Jabovsky, John Reed, Bayet Steiner, Jeff Bessner, Kirsten Reed, Rob Murray, and rounding out the team, Nigel Proctor. It's a young crew. Their average age, just 24. I am excited by the prospects of flying to Mount Waddington, but also anxious. Although I've been skiing for 22 years, including many years in Europe, it has always been at ski resorts. You take the lift to the top, eat at a restaurant, and drink a cold beer in the hot tub at the end of a long day. This is different. The mountain is big and wild. I have never climbed and skied such an imposing peak before. The flight to Mount Waddington is aboard a Swiss Pilatus Porter stole aircraft. A plane is specially designed for short takeoff and landing work on glaciers. Soon, British Columbia's spectacular geography unfolds below. To the right, Blackcomb and Whistler Mountain. Stretching to the east and north, uninterrupted wilderness. Mount Waddington. It's much bigger than expected. Bigger than anything in my experience. Slowly, I make peace with the mountain's majesty and my insignificance. The team prepares the assault on the peak in two stages. The first day's climb from base camp on the Tiedemann Glacier at 6,500 feet is 3,000 feet up to combatant call, a 
an ideal location for an advanced camp. Day two, they will push for the peak, another 3,500 feet up. We are confident, full of energy and enthusiasm for the strenuous climb ahead. Initially, we make good time, but as the crevasses get bigger and more numerous, our pace slows. They are hundreds of feet deep. It is obvious we underestimated the distance and the difficulties involved in climbing to the Matin Kull. Finally, the team reaches Combatant Col, the staging area for the second part of the climb. It has taken two days instead of one, putting them behind schedule and draining their resources. Nevertheless, anticipating a big day in the morning, they enjoy the rest of the afternoon, skiing warm-up runs and practicing their technique. By that evening, however, the weather turns and the following morning a storm dominates the upper reaches of the peak. They cannot penetrate the blizzard and must return to camp. And here we are, after giving it our best shot so far, and we've been defeated by the weather. Yeah, it's too bad that it got fogged in up there, eh? I mean, we, we, could, have, we could have made it this morning. It looked really hopeful. Except for my well, we were certainly all ready for it, I think. It's quite mild here compared to just a uh, hundred meters up. To add insult to failure, we have used all our cooking fuel and must eat the last of the food straight from the packages. Frozen minute steak and congealed mushroom sauce. I'm so hungry, I secretly enjoy mine. In the morning, the weather continues to deteriorate. There is no temptation to give it one last try to go for the peak. The skiers have been gone for three days, but know that base camp, a hot meal, and good company are waiting. The climb up took a total of 10 hours. Coming down takes only 40 minutes. Good stuff. Mm. What did I miss most of all, eh? Hey? <laughs> oh, you can act, too. <laughs> oh, come on, Bat. Enjoy. Oh, I'll have a drink of that one. Mm -hmm. oh! What a ski, huh? Morning, Incredible. Ski. Very good. <laughs> yeah, that thunderstorm. I hit my ski. And I bit, was out there, and the, the skis were actually glowing with oh, green. Hey? And then the night before, on the way up, easy, nice fall. Oh. Rock came down. Found oh, straight over bay. Yeah, we missed my bed. We missed this guy. We were out of bed. Got a second slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the wind must have been about 60 miles per hour or, or more. And it would be totally still. And then all of a sudden. <laughs> and you'd have to actually plug your ears. They eh? wake up and plug your ears. <laughs> We are disappointed by the setback, but not willing to give up. We decide that in the morning, four of us will try again, by a different route, hopefully climb and ski the peak in one day. We refresh ourselves with new supplies and a quick bath. Dawn rises bright. It's a perfectly clear day, but also early, 5 a.m. The team knows that success depends on every spare minute. They have to climb a total of 6,600 feet and negotiate a lengthy traverse over hanging glaciers and underneath Mount Waddington's imposing central spire. Climbing as far as the final plateau leading up to the base of Mount Waddington 
it's obvious the plan was overly ambitious. It's already 2 p.m. Furthermore, Mount Waddington holds true to its reputation, bad weather. It's time to concede defeat, and once again, an extreme descent. With our first encounter on Mount Waddington behind us, we are already planning a second attempt. We have learned a lot and know that with luck, next time we can be successful. The climbing history of Mount Waddington is largely the story of Don and Phyllis Mundy. On the day Phyllis discovers the mountain, in 1925, the Mundys determined to climb it traveled to Mount Waddington 11 consecutive summers in pursuit of their goal. On their fourth try, the Mondays succeed in climbing the Northwest Peak. It's an epic 40-hour struggle, but ends in frustration when they crest the summit only to find the central spire rising another hundred feet, an impassable chasm gaping before them. Peter and Bayet visit Phyllis, now 93. I'd like to hear Phyllis talk about when she first climbed the Northwest Peak, came over that rise. And saw oh, that, that was that the most pinnacle. thrilling thing I think I ever did. Really, certainly was the most thrilling thing up to that day, anyway. To see the whole world, as it were, at your feet, and all those wonderful glaciers. I think any climber would understand just what it seems to touch a soul, I think. It's very difficult for a person to try to explain, actually, but it's, uh, it's worth whatever effort you put into it. Doesn't matter how hard it is. I'd go back again and no. It's an experience that one never, never forgets. And a, an experience that you treasure. Um, I can't say you treasure the hardships of it, but the the joy and the of getting there, and something that you really want to do in the mountains. And we did it. Sadly, the Mondays never managed to climb the rock summit, the true peak. They do, however, supply accurate maps and information to subsequent expeditions. And on July 21st, 1936, two Americans, Fritz Weisner and William House, make the historic ascent. Fritz Weisner, an experienced Himalayan climber, commented at the time, in 20 years of climbing, I've never encountered a harder mountain for its altitude. That goes for the Alps in Europe or anywhere else. You have returned to try again. Although our high-tech attempt to ski the peak cannot be compared to the struggle of early explorers, it is Phyllis Mundy's determination and courage that inspires us to fulfill our goal. We pack our things, then wait for the weather to clear. I think back to last year and look forward to tomorrow. I know that Mount Waddington is a serious peak, that climbers much better than myself have tried to climb it and failed. Mount Waddington is its own master, kind to some, ruthlessly unjust to others. Over the past year, I trained together with my partners, skiing a number of first descents, honing my climbing skills, and hoping for a chance to ski this mountain, which has come to mean so much to me. 
In the morning, the team choppers into base camp on combatant call. All right, there's the key. All right. Okay, we can see. You see that little button way up on the top? The ski down that. Incredible ski on there. Two and snow fields. We can spend weeks here. The terrain below is vast and inhospitable. Glaciers dominate the valleys for many kilometers in all directions. Crevasses are hundreds of feet deep. The peaks are jagged rock. Calving glaciers, exfoliating granite, and thunderous explosions make constant testimony to the ever-present unpredictability and danger of the mountain. Joining Peter and Bayad on this second attempt are Trevor Peterson and Steve Smarage. The chopper pilot throws us a final wave and is gone. We are alone, cut off from contact with the outside world. Theoretically, the climb to the northwest peak and ski descent back to base camp are now possible in one day, but there are still many difficulties. 60 mile an hour winds batter the tent the following morning threatening to rip it apart. Hoping to deflect the wind over the top of the tent, Trevor struggles outside to build a wind block. It may continue storming for a week, and the camp must be strong to survive. Later, there's nothing to do but wait. weather finally clears. They know that this may be the only chance, and so hurry to prepare their gear, eager to be climbing, eager to get to the top. follows that pioneered by the Mundys back in the 20s. Things have changed little over the passing years. After eight hours of climbing, only the final nub, a 70 degree pitch of unskiable ice remains. But time is running out a storm is brewing, and it will soon be dark. The skiers must hurry in order to get back to the security of their camp. But I want to go to the top. Cresting the northwest summit and seeing the magnificent central spire, I finally understand what drove Phyllis Mundy to return 11 years in a row. It is now even more pressing to get down. Too late. In the driving storm, fading light, it is too dangerous to ski or down climb the ice fall. We must bivouac. Sleeping in the open at minus 25, it will be a long, cold night. We huddle together, hoping to offset the oncoming hypothermia. In the morning, we can see enough to pick our way down. Although conditions and terrain are not as good and exciting as some other descents, we finally get to ski Mount Waddington from the top.
This is great. I love it up here. The mountain has really meant something special to me. Home free, only easy skiing left and nothing dangerous. With Waddington behind us, I wonder where we will ski next. Back at base camp, the skiers discover their food cache has been destroyed by a wolverine. It's time to go home. They radio the helicopter to come pick them up. Then enjoy the afternoon, skiing quick runs in the fresh powder snow. Later in the day, the helicopter plucks them off the mountain, as easily as it brought them. An expedition that began three years earlier ends in success. The dream to ski Mount Waddington is finally fulfilled.